Christ Gospel Church of St. Petersburg, Florida, where Bishop Preston D.H. Leonard is our international presiding bishop and Dr. Tony Young Jr. is our pastor. We are the church where everyone is welcome, where the Bible is the guide and the Holy Ghost is the director. We are delighted you decided to join us today and pray you will be richly blessed by the praise and worship and by the rhema word from the Lord. Please share this link with your family and friends as we prepare to go into our service. May God bless you.
Good morning and welcome again everyone to another segment of Sunday School. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to continue our lesson on this beautiful five letter word, grace, God's grace. And just to recall really where we were, we're in Romans 5 and we're going to go back to where we started. So we're going to wrap up where we started and that was Romans 5 verse 20b where it says but where sin abounded grace did much more abound and today we're going to be speaking on the measurement of grace what is this much more how do we measure it well i'm going to start with a illustration and so let's say if i'm with you and i give you a dollar just out of kindness of my heart, I'm just like, yeah, here, here's a dollar. I would like for you to have it. You'll say, well, thank you, you know, and you'll probably be appreciative of it. You know, um, it's out of the kindness of my heart. But if I turn around right in that same moment and I give someone else $20, you may say now, okay, now I got the dollar, but they got more than I did. Well, how about if I turn around and I gave that person maybe a hundred, a couple hundred dollars, then you're going to be like, wait a minute, now I got a dollar, but they got much more. And so it is with grace that where sin abounds, so if it was flourishing, it was plentiful, where sin was and it was abounding, it was a lot of it, grace did much more abound. And I think that Paul does a wonderful job of just illustrating this in um, chapter five of Romans. You know, he starts off this chapter speaking of grace and the benefits of grace that were justified through God's salvation, through the salvation that we have through our faith in Jesus Christ, who's shed his blood for us. And we were redeemed and justified. And much more than that, that we have now have access and we can be confidently stand in grace. We can rejoice in hope. Verse two tells us, and he goes on to say, and not only that, but during those hard times, we can still find glory and reasons to praise and give him thanks because we know that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience. And then with experience comes this hope, this hope and glory, this hope of eternal life that we can have. And all of that is stemming from this wonderful grace that God has bestowed upon us. And you know, it's unmerited. It has nothing to do with anything that we've done, but because of his favor, his desire to just have communion with us, that his grace has said, you know, I love them. I love this creation. And even in their sinful state, I am going to do what it takes to bring them in right standing with me. And really so that they can reap the benefits. And that's what Paul does. He tells us, he just lays out benefit after benefit all the way until he gets to verse 12 of chapter five. And really that's when you have to kind of halt and the break stop because in that verse, if we can read it there, it tells you, tells us in Romans five verse 12, it says that Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men for that all have sin. Wow. It just lays out really how powerful sin is. One man sin, that man had death, but not only that, everyone after him now has death sentence. That is, to me, the description of a weapon of mass destruction. Sin is such a powerful weapon, weapon of mass destruction, and the destruction that it is reaping on every single person is death. However, you know, that's a powerful thing. But if you move down to verse 15, and it says, but not as the offense, the sin, So also is the free gift. Uh Uh-oh, 
grace steps on the scene. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. So we start to see really this point playing out. Sin has a point, very powerful, right? By one man, sin came on the scene, but by one man, grace comes on the scene, point for grace. But then we continue, and I love how Paul plays it out. In verse 16, it continues and says, by one man the sin, so is by one man the gift. All right, sin has a point. The gift has a point. He continues, by one offense, death comes on the scene. But by one justification, we have redemption through Christ Jesus. All right, point for um, really this point game going back and forth. Sin up to bat, grace up to bat. Judgment up to bat, eternal life through Jesus Christ up to bat. And it continues on through verse 19. By one disobedience, all are sinners. But by one obedience, all become justified and all have re righteousness and redemption. However, when we're starting to measure, again, is reason why I love and I'm so excited about verse 20. It says, and we'll read the entire verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The law now magnified it, made it even more rampant. It flourished that when the law came on the scene so that it could really point it out and magnify it. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Wherever sin is, wherever we, and I think it's so timely this verse and so applicable to our current situation we see destruction all around us we see disease we see death we see sadness but wherever sadness is no matter how rampant it is no matter where disease is no matter how great it may be no matter where death is how much we may see the numbers from COVID-19 go up grace did much more abound so when we talk about the measurement of grace, and this is the wonderful thing about it, Paul doesn't tell you that, or uh, puts a number on it. It just says, wherever you see it, and no matter how great that number is, grace is much more. No matter what sin does or how rampant it may be, grace is much more. It much more did, it much more abounded, it much more flourished. And so for us, we can be, take comfort in knowing that no matter what craziness, no matter what sin we see around us, that we can look and look out for grace because it's going to much more abound in that situation. So no matter how many, how much grace sin may be, grace is going to be much more. And I love it because that means grace is endless. So no matter what number you put on it, grace is going to be much more. It's going to outweigh whatever sin brings, no matter how rapid it may be, no matter how powerful it's going to be, grace is going to still be much more. I hope that you are encouraged today by knowing what grace is, how powerful grace is, how much more grace is. May it be seen and illustrated and manifested in your life.
feed us with manna from on high. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. 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 You can be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to thank God, amen, for Reverend Shields and his yeah. ministry of yeah. video taking. Yeah. Things that he has a passion for. He never comes to the office asking for a dime, a nickel, a quarter, a dollar. He just does it. And many times, you know, when I'm least thinking about it, he give me a package of videos. Wow. And, you know, and I know that uh, videos, material are not free. Last time I checked, I couldn't go to Best Buy and speak in tongues, and they gave me a new one. So thank you, sir, for all that you do. Uh, in the name of Jesus. Today I want to talk about discovering your greatness. Discovering your greatness. I want you to know that there is some greatness inside of you. Can you do me a favor? Because your neighbor may not know who you are. I want you to look at them and ask them, do you know who I am? Now I want you to tell them there is some greatness inside of me. And just so you don't sound too conceited, look at them and say there is some greatness inside of you. Amen. Discovery of your greatness. This next gentleman you probably know, Booker T. Washington, the renowned like educator was an outstanding example of greatness. And uh, there's a story that says shortly after he became president of the Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, he was walking in an exclusive part of town. And he was stopped by a wealthy white woman. Not knowing who he was, she asked if he could, if he would like to earn a few bucks chopping some wood for her. Now y'all know us. And we get one letter behind our name. But anyway, because Mr. Washington was not pressing for time, he smiled and rolled up his sleeves and proceeded to do this humble chore that she had requested. When he finished, he carried the chopped logs into the house and he stacked them by the fireplace. While he was there, a little girl recognized who he really was. And she revealed this to the lady. Well, the next morning, the lady being so embarrassed, she went to see Mr. Washington in his office and apologized repeatedly. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. He replied, it's perfectly all right, ma'am. Occasionally, I enjoy doing a little manual labor. She shook his hand firmly and assured him that his meek and gracious spirit touched her heart. Not long afterwards, she showed her admiration by persuading some of her wealthy acquaintances mm -hmm. to join her in donating thousands of dollars to the Tuskegee Institute. All right. Brothers and sisters, his his greatness was not in his superiority. His greatness was in his servanthood. You see, his effort earned him a few dollars, but his greatness earned him thousands. Mr. Washington had many famous quotes, which I think I've invented two of them. He says, if you want to lift yourself up, then lift somebody else up. Anybody know what that means? Amen. He also said, those who are the happiest are those who do the most for other people. Right. Amen. Isn't that a wonderful story about a man who started out in very humble beginnings? And I think he ended on top of his pinnacle. Oh, yeah. But the wisdom that he leaves with us today is paramount and it aligns with the Word of God. Amen. Speaking of the Word of God, let's go to the Word of God uh, in Luke 22, verses 24 through 26. I will be reading from the New King James Version for clarity. Please follow along with me. It reads, Now 
there was also a dispute among the disciples well. as to which of them should be considered the greatest. Uh -huh. He said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, but those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors, that means friend of the people. Mm -hmm. But not so among you. Well. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the young, well. and he who governs as he who serves. Yes. Take a long less reader here and do us of his holy word. When I think of the greatest, I think of a acronym GOAT. Anybody ever heard that acronym G-O-A-T? That means greatest of all times. When I call out some sports, I want you to just talk to me uh, and tell me what you think. Basketball. Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan. Now, who told y'all that? Michael Jordan is one of the greatest. Now, you know, if you talk to some of the bronze fans, they may debate and say, you know, I don't know, but I'm just saying those are great players in their field. When you think of football, quarterbacks, who do you think about? Now, I see y'all going, I mean, traumatizing in your neighbors. But they tell me when I look up the statistics that Tom Brady, thank you, Jesus, uh, is one of the greatest of all time. Whether you like him or not, you cannot dispute his play on the field. Don't hate the player, hate the game, all right? So he is considered by many analysts to be one of the greatest. When you think about tennis, you cannot, you cannot remove Sharina and Venus because they have proven themselves on both sides of the net. <coughs> Some of you may not have been touched, but let me touch your stomach. Some people will argue the Whopper is the greatest, while others said no, it's the Big Mac. <laughs> but brothers, there has been this debate over time, who is the greatest? And it's no different in the church well, house. Well, well. Jesus is talking to his chosen anointed disciples and they are sitting up having a dispute yes. over who is the greatest. Yes. In our text, just to give you a prelay of what was happening, um, the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, you know it as the Passover, was approaching. Satan had got into Judas, and Judas was working with the scribes and the chief priests trying to figure out how much money he going to get to betray Jesus. In the meantime, Jesus sends Peter and John to prepare the Passover meal for them. And then there at the table, Jesus tells his disciples, boys, I'm not going to be with y'all too much longer. So when Jesus tells them that he is leaving, you can imagine, oh, there will be a vacancy at the head of the table. Yes, our text starts with the words, now there was also a dispute among them, which tells me this was not the first dispute. This was not the only issue going on. But among the issues, you see, when there's always one issue, you can find a couple of more. If there's somebody complaining about one thing, they're complaining about something else. Can I help you? If somebody is complaining about the choir, they're probably complaining about the deacon board. If somebody's complaining about the deacon board, they're probably complaining about amen, everybody else. So whenever you see somebody complaining, you need to run away. And go find somebody who you can, amen, lift up yeah. so that you can, amen, not get bogged down in that kind of stuff. Yeah. They wanted to know, Jesus, since you're about to leave us, tell us before you leave which one of us qualifies to be the greatest. Because if you tell us who's the greatest, then we'll know we'll take your chair when you are not here. Good. Now, let me just tell you, Jesus had a powerful earthly ministry. Oh, yeah. Are y'all going to pray with me today? Amen. Jesus was the most famous man during his time on earth. Oh, yeah. 
And he didn't travel the seven seas. I mean, but he was known all over the world. Yeah. Jesus had thousands of followers. Yeah. Jesus' Twitter account was giant. <laughs> and his Facebook page was one of the most popular in the world. Right. How many of y'all can say that? Yeah. Bless his holy name. Jesus had it going on. And so they were asking Jesus all of this publicity and saying, Jesus, you just can't walk off, but tell us which one of us will take over the ministry. Who is the greatest? I stopped by to tell some of you today and remind others of you, some people are just waiting around for you to die so they can get your stuff. Yes. Yes. Oh, bless his holy name. There are some people that will show up in the church waiting for the bishop to die. Oh, come on now. So that they can get a position. Oh, but I got some good news for you. You just hang around a few more minutes. There are some people hanging around your house. God, thank God for our kids and grandkids, but some of them are just hanging around for you to die so they can get your house. So they can get your money. Uh, some of your so-called friends hanging around your house waiting for you to die so they can get your spouse. Oh. <laughs> now I heard somebody, and I'm going to pray for you, somebody said he didn't have them, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not playing with you. I'm going to pray for you right now in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but I want you to know this, what God has for you, it's for you. What God has it's for, you, for you, it is for you. Yes, yes. I tell you this, what God has for me, Go ahead. you can't have it because it's for me. Yes. And when we understand that inside of all of us, God has given us greatness. Yes. And when we left bickering and disputing mm. among brothers and sisters. Today I want to give you three things on how you can discover your greatness. Would you like to know how you can discover your greatness? Because it's in there whether you know it or not. Yes, Lord. So the first thing I want to uh, let you know about discovering your greatness is your greatness, it serves others. Your greatness serves others. Look at verse 25 and 26. There. And Jesus said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. And those who exercise authority are called the friends of the people. But he says, but not so among you. And if you missed it, he says, on the contrary, it's just the opposite. For if you want to serve in my kingdom, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger of those that serve others. Jesus is saying to us today that in the earthly kingdom, I need you to listen, amen, to me real close. Jesus is saying that in the earthly realm, others serve kings. When people get big jobs and become CEO, they don't fix their own coffee. They don't back up the floors. No, 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 no. No, you know, the people serve them. That's what Jesus is saying when he's saying, but listen, but in my kingdom, mm -hmm. those who are the greatest will, will have to serve others. Brothers and sisters, your greatness, just like Booker T showed us earlier today, your greatness is not in your degrees. Go ahead. Your greatness is not in how much you prophesy or speak in tongues. Yeah. Your greatness is not how big your bank account is. Go ahead. But your greatness is how Yes, Lord. There's too many folks yes. that are trying to go that way. Hallelujah. Only to find out when they get to the top of the ladder, it's leaning against the wrong house. Jesus. Ooh. Hallelujah. Ooh. Bless his holy name. When you discover your greatness, it will never promote self-interest. Greatness in the kingdom of God is not self-centered. All right. Yes, greatness from God does not pursue money. You see, actually, money pursues you. All right. Oh. Earth 
earthly says, earthly uh, pursuit says you have to, you know, grind. You have to work hard. You have to get up and you have to pursue this and pursue that. And one day you wake up and you will arrive. But God said, when you pursue me, first seek ye the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And while you running after righteousness and God, the Bible says money is chasing you. Houses is chasing you. Relationship is chasing you because when you seek God first, he says all these things will chase you and catch you. But when we chase stuff, guess what? When we chase stuff, that becomes our God and God is somewhere else. So it's important for us to know that greatness is in serving others. Look at somebody that says, we got to serve others. Yes, yes, yes. One thing I didn't tell you about Mr. Booker T. Washington, Professor Washington, is he was born into slavery. He was born as a slave. You know that? In 1856. Now you would think if you're born into that environment, it's a lifetime curse. But what's interesting to me is 25 years after he was born as a slave, 25 years he became president of Tuskegee Institute. 25 years. And y'all know that must have been really hard for anyone to do. But I believe if Booker T was here, he would say something like this. It don't matter what I was born into. Rather, it's important to know what was born in me. Even though I was a slave and I was mistreated, there was something inside of me that I heard the voice of God saying that there is greatness in you, Booker T. And all of my life, in spite of what people said and how they looked at me, I knew that I had to discover my greatness. And one day I discovered that I had an ability and a greatness to educate others. And at 25 years old, how many of you know any 25-year-olds today who becomes presidents of universities and colleges? But I stop by to tell you that when there is greatness in you, you don't have to wait a lifetime to achieve it. It doesn't matter what you're going through, hell or high water, your greatness will overcome the world. Now let me talk there and let you know that my message is about Christ Jesus and the Holy Ghost. Because outside of Jesus Christ and the power of him, we are just filthy, old, dirty, stinking rags. Even our best is no good. But thank God Jesus came to turn that around. You know, Booker T said, you know, he says, I discovered my greatness and those who are the happiest are those who serve others the best. Not only should we know that when you discover your greatness, it will promote you serving others. So that simply means if you find something that's all about you, that is not greatness from God. All right. Amen. Amen. If everything is about me, myself, and the other guy, then it's really not greatness from God. Greatness will always cause you to want to help somebody else become better. That's right. Number two, your greatness comes from trials. Your greatness comes from, anybody been through some trials lately? Yeah. 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 Well, I'm about to make the devil really angry with me because he don't want you to know number two. Verse 28 says, Jesus is talking, he says, but you are those who continue with me in my trials. See, a lot of folks don't want to talk about the cross and Calvary. They don't want to talk about that you have to suffer. Amen. They tell you that if you're saved, sanctified, and you're supposed to be rich and have five jets and five Mercedes and, and Bentleys, and you're just supposed to, brothers and sisters, if ain't nobody making waves with you, then you are definitely going the wrong direction. Because I know people, and I know that people like to play a hate. Anybody got some player haters in your life? No matter what you get, 
They look at you crazy. Yeah. Who do you think you are? You ain't, gonna, you ain't said nothing. All you did was pay the church and rejoice. Thank God for blessing me. Yeah. And somebody looking at you, why are you looking so, you know, uh, uh. Anybody that's complaining and player hating simply means that they are not doing what they need to do to discover their greatness. Right. Yeah. Right. Yes. But Jesus said, hey, if you want to be great, I need you to continue with me in my trials. And there's two things Jesus is saying here. I hope you got it. One, he said, is not just go through trials, but he says, continue with me in my trials. All right. I did not catch that. Some of us, we good at starting out with Jesus. Amen. We get our suit and our dress and we dress up and we come to church one or two times. Amen. Somebody starts talking about us and we'll pray one or two times. But your greatness is not surface. Your, great, your greatness is found in depth. Some of the biggest fishes you find will not be on the surface. All right. They have some fishes that you can just throw a piece of bread out and they'll come up to the top. Is that right anymore? Yeah. Yeah. They'll come up to the top of a piece of bread and you can just almost reach out and you get a, a fish in there and catch those. But there are some other fish that you ain't going to be able to throw no bread on the top. You're going to have to get into a school diver too. And you're going to have to go deep into the water. This is where your greatness is hidden. Some of us, we don't stay with God long enough to see the greatness that God is trying to pull out of you. Yeah, yeah. We go through one or two dark days in our life and we're ready to throw in the towel. I tried to throw in the towel one time and Jesus threw the towel back and said, wipe your face, it ain't over. <laughs> You ain't giving up this easy. There's some more greatness in you that I got to clean out. Look at somebody and say, there's some more greatness in you that God wants to bring out. Y'all remember James? A couple of months ago, we studied in the book of James. One of the things James says, he says, my brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. There it is again. James knew something. James knew that your greatness comes from your trials. Yes. So James says, don't wait till the battle is over. Shout now. Amen. Yes. Oh, see, the devil don't want you to know this. One of the ways you can confuse the enemy is when you're going through troubles and you don't even understand how you're going to get out of it. Just start thanking God. God, I just thank you. Thank you, God. I thank you for the victory. God, I thank you for delivering me. Thank you, yes. Thank you, God, for paying all my bills. Thank yes. you for saving all my wayward children. God, I thank you for giving me a promotion. God, now you ain't even got a job. But God, I thank you for the job and the promotion. God, I thank you for the victory. Jesus. Because it's in the trial that God shows up. Yes. So God sends the trial so that he can get with you in the darkness. Because God has made darkness his provision. And it's in the dark places that God will meet you. Amen. And he injects you with greatness. So if you never go through trials and tribulations, you'll never understand the greatness that God has put in you. The devil don't want you to know that every test and trial that you have been through has been nothing but preparation for God to reveal your greatness. Jesus. Every tribulation, every everything that you have been through is preparing you for the day of your greatness. Ah, uh, anybody ever been lied on? Anybody ever been rejected? Every lie of rejection, every disappointment is just God showing up to prepare you for your destiny. Every, every problem, every provocation, every predicament, everything that you've gone through, every letdown, every headache and heartache is God trying to get your attention so that he can pull your greatness out. So there's nothing lost with God. If you serve God every, every, every death, 
ever disappoint. Yes, we may not understand it, but the old, the old hymns are some of the best hymns that I know that it may not be Bible, but some of them said by and by. I'm sitting here crying. My bed is wet with tears, but all I can say is, Lord, by and by, when the morning comes. Very good. I don't understand it, but God, what I get in all God's children, uh, I know God that one day I'm going to understand it better. By and by. By and by. I'm not going to get it all today, but I know that if I hang in there and continue with you in your child, then my greatness is going to be resurrected and it's going to conquer death. And I'll have victory. Anybody want some victory today? Anybody? I'll, if you want victory today, I want you to say, I will not give up. I will not give up. But I'm going to continue with him. Continue with him. In trial. In trial. Hello everyone, it's LaQuinda Fuller coming on behalf of this year's Pastoral Anniversary Committee. We're excited about this event that we're planning and it's going to be the pastoral anniversary celebration for our leaders, Bishop Preston D.H. Leonard and Pastor Tony Young. It will take place in December, Saturday, December 5th at 3 to 5 p.m. at the church, 2512 22nd Avenue South. We will have a motor parade that we are inviting you to come out and be a part of. So please plan December 5th, that's Saturday, 3 to 5 p.m. to come drive through and shower our leaders with love and cards and appreciation for their great work. I'm back. 